Well, hey guys, uh, thanks for taking the time to pause and watch this video along with the others that we are putting together in preparation for our first weekend together. Uh, a couple of us have continued to work on the content for this training and we were talking about the two books that are recommended reading for the first part of the training. Um, and, and as we were talking, we are, were guessing that some of you really enjoy reading. And, and like my wife, you can blaze through books really quickly. Um, others of you, though, uh, might be like me, and you read at a turtle's pace. So maybe uh, just do your best at some point to crack the books open and skim them. Um, but in either case, uh, both of the books get in, into some deeper themes so we wanted to shoot a couple of videos that would summarize the key parts and, and introduce the key themes of the books. Uh, I'm going to use this video to uh, introduce this book, uh, Surprised by Hope, um, by N.T. Wright. And um, uh, N.T. Wright is, is known sort of as the, the C.S. Lewis of our uh, generation. Um, this book, Surprised by Hope, centers around two questions that have to do with Christian hope. What are we waiting for and what are we going to do about it in the meantime? He gets into themes of eschatology, uh, the study of end times, uh, heaven, hell, uh, what the kingdom of heaven actually is. Uh, and, and that might seem like some heavy stuff to start this training with, um, but as we've prepared content, uh, we've realized that starting this training with a strong theological base is important for then being able to build solid, solidly on it with practical stuff that we'll get into later in the training. Um, and, and believe it or not, this area of theology has a lot of impact on the way we view our neighbors and our neighborhoods. So I, I, I think that, that using a bit of my story to explain that connection would help because I, I suspect that uh, most of us in this group uh, grew up in a similar evangelical church setting as I did. Or, or you've spent a good number of years in evangelical churches, so I, I would bet that we've got some things in common when it comes to certain areas of, of theology or doctrine. In the church I grew up in, uh, there was a lot of talk about heaven. We talked about heaven a lot. Uh, and, and heaven was always described as this place that was um, sort of out there somewhere, up, up in the clouds, uh, out, out beyond this this earth, certainly not on this earth, beyond this earth somewhere. It was always pretty vague as to where that was. Uh, and, and, and so I, I always felt a little confused about what what or where heaven uh, is and was. And, and um, uh, thankfully, the, those who spoke about heaven didn't, end up describing heaven as a place where we were fat little cupid angels floating around in the clouds with harps and that sort of thing. Uh, but it, it, it certainly was confusing to think about where and what heaven was about. Additionally, there was this sort of emphasis on salvation as being uh, something that you experienced in order to get to heaven. Uh, that, that was what salvation was, was uh, praying a prayer that would allow you to uh, experience heaven, go to heaven when you die, and, or if you were lucky enough to be a part of the generation of people on earth that would be raptured to heaven and not have to experience death at all. So to escape this life um, was, was a, a goal, was a hope, because this world is awful and it's a, it's, a, it's a terrible place, and the best that we can hope for, our hope as Christians, was, would be to escape this place uh, through, through death or through the rapture and going to heaven up there somewhere. Uh, and then once that happened, God would sort of uh, unleash his wrath, his fury, through the tribulation and destroy this awful place. But, but this is not the vision of the New Testament for God's creation. Uh, it wasn't the view of the early Christians. It has not been the, the view of the church through the, throughout the centuries. This sort of interpretation of the book of Revelation and, and other passages that deal with the end times uh, it came, on, it came on the scene uh, not too long ago, it was about the early, early 20th century. And, it, and then it worked its way recently over the last couple of de decades 
into Christian pop culture through uh, things like the Left Behind book series and other forms of media. And those things might make for entertaining reading or films, but, but not good theology. Uh, our vision as, as followers of Jesus is, is entirely different and, and much more redemptive, much more beautiful uh, than that. Salvation is so much greater than being saved from hell, so much more than being saved from something, it's being saved to something. And I want to read a few uh, highlights from, from the book here that help explain uh, what we're talking about. This is page uh, 198 in, in Surprised by Hope. Uh, he, he writes, Salvation then is not going to heaven, but being raised to life in God's new heaven and new earth. Salvation's not going to heaven, but being raised to life in God's new heaven and new earth. As soon as we put it like that, like this, we realize that the New Testament is full of hints, indications, uh, assertions that salvation is, isn't just something we have to wait for in the long distance future. We can enjoy it in the here and now, genuinely anticipating in the present what is to come in the future. For the first Christians, the ultimate salvation was all about God's new world. And the point of what Jesus and the apostles were doing when they were healing people's bodies was that this was an anticipation of that ultimate salvation. The healing transformation of space, time, and matter. The future rescue that God had planned and promised was starting to come true here in the present. It's not just our souls but our bodies too, all of who we are, our whole being uh, as humans, all that we are is, is being resurrected and made new in God's new heaven and new earth. When we talk about new creation, when we talk about all things being made new, this is what we're talking about. The point is this, when God saves people in this life by working through his spirit to bring them to faith and by leading them to follow Jesus in discipleship, prayer, holiness, hope, and love, such people are designed to be a sign, a foretaste of what God wants to do with the entire cosmos, the, the, whole, the whole of creation. What he's doing in us is a sign for, for what he's going to do for the whole, for the entirety of his creation, right? And, and even more than that, it's not that just that we're a sign of what's to come and what he's doing, but we're a part of that. We're the means by which God makes this happen in both the present and the future. So to, to sum all of that up, he says, the work of salvation in its fullest sense is number one, about a whole human beings, not merely about souls. It's about the present, not simply the future. And it's about what God does through us, not merely what God, God does in and for us. And if we can get this straight, we will discover the historic basis for the full mission of the church. To pursue this further, we need to look at the larger picture within which all of this makes sense, the kingdom of God. So he goes on then to, to talk about uh, Jesus when he speaks about the kingdom of heaven, which is the central theme of Jesus' teaching. Uh, so it's important that we get this right. He's not talking about a place uh, up in the sky. The kingdom of heaven is not this this. this uh, place out there in the universe in some other galaxy somewhere. He's talking about a reality that is just around the corner, as it were. It's just right there. And even though we can't fully see it yet in a tangible way, it has come and it is coming in, 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 in all its fullness. In Christ, God brought heaven to earth. This is the historic view of the early Christians and, and of the church throughout the centuries. There's a simple uh, saying that theologians when ta uh, use when they talk about the kingdom. And, and you, you may have heard this. In fact, uh, Pastor Mike actually shared this in a series uh, when he was preaching about the kingdom not too long ago. And the, the, the saying is, is that the kingdom is, is the already, but not yet. It's, 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 uh, it's the now, but it's not yet. Um, the kingdom has already come to this world in a substantial way through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And ever since it's been breaking through into this reality that we can see and feel and taste and touch, we get, and, we, and we get glimpses of it all the time, right? Uh, think about your daily life. You get glimpses, glimpses of God's kingdom through things like um, the beauty and wonder and innocence of our children, 
um, or, or when we're lost in a moment of worship at church, we, we, we sort of have this sense that it's, it's here, it's with us, we're, 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 we're in the kingdom, we're experiencing the kingdom, and we, and we sense it in these small ways, but then we also can see it in larger ways, like good schools where edu- good education is helping us more fully appreciate the grandeur of God's creation. Or uh, when we look at hospitals where the sick and the diseased are made well, uh, or, or other works of justice and goodness in this world, oftentimes it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's overwhelming. And, and it's so good and beautiful, and we sense it in such a, 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 a powerful way that it brings tears to our eyes, right? Um, in, in one moment, uh, we, we see it and feel it as though we are completely immersed in it, uh, but then the next it feels like it's gone. Like a like a, a dream a good dream that was interrupted by an, an annoying alarm clock buzzer, and, and then we're confronted with the harsh realities that the kingdom is not yet. Um, when we read the news about millions of refugees suffering, or, or overcrowded prisons, or kids who are being trafficked into sex slavery, or then we look at our own ugly habits and and the hangups in our own lives, it's painfully obvious that the, the kingdom has not yet arrived in its fullness. So, uh, so that's that's uh, you know a summary of, of of the book. But what does this have to do with being a parish pastor or ministry in the neighborhood? Uh, if we have the the view of heaven that and the fate of this world that's similar to what I grew up with, then the the good of the neighborhood really doesn't matter because the rapture is going to happen at any minute. And then once we're raptured out of here, um, God is going to pour out His wrath and burn the place up. So why would I invest in the neighborhood? Why should I have any concern for this place or any other place in the world? Uh, why should my concern extend beyond saving souls? In my relationships with my neighbors, you know, it, it, it from that perspective becomes driven by a hidden agenda that's that's solely focused, only focused on getting them to say the sinner's prayer so they can escape this rotten world with me, and so they won't burn in hell. Um, uh, and of course, heaven and hell are absolutely uh, a part of our theology as eternal realities. We we believe in the reality of heaven and hell, um, but those things have to be understood through the lens of Jesus' teaching about the kingdom. And, and, and when we talk about making spiritual decisions, those are critical, obviously. We've all made important spiritual decisions in our lives. And, and those are critical as long as they're tied to how I live this life in the here and now. So as we, as we embrace these ancient truths of the New Testament and of the church, it leads us to a much greater vision of our lives. We become what N.T. Wright describes later in the book as colleagues and partners in that larger project, working for the good of our neighborhood, our region, and our world. Um, I, I love this last quote. I'll leave you, I'll leave you with this. I, uh, this is from page 193, and it talks about uh, this work that we're about. Uh, he, he says here um, that... Uh, what you do in the present uh, by painting, preaching, singing, sowing, praying, teaching, building hospitals, digging wells, campaigning for justice, writing poems, caring for the needy, loving your neighbor as yourself. These things will last into God's future. They are a part of what we would call building for God's kingdom. Uh, or, or we also call it bringing God's kingdom to bear in the here and now. And the more that God's kingdom is brought to bear in this world, the easier it is to speak about it, to point to the signs that it's here among us, and realizing that all of us, Christians and non-Christians alike, we are oriented with desires to be a part of this life in the kingdom. And because of that, we have a lot more in common with our neighbors, regardless of what faith uh, they are. Uh, A lot more in common than we realize. All of these desires for God's kingdom are a great starting point uh, for building relationships that lead to redemption and salvation of our lives, of our neighborhoods, and the whole of creation. All right. 
Well, thanks for listening, guys. I just summarized one of the most important 300-page theological textbooks of the 21st century in about 15 minutes. So if you've got questions or you feel like your head's going to explode, that's okay. It's normal. Um, Write any questions down that you have, uh, any thoughts that you have, and we'll definitely spend some time talking about all of this when we get together soon. Peace.